Sometimes you meet someone and you just know this is a person who's making a difference. Amanda Nummy is one of those people and she's with us today as a guest on Sustainably Speaking. She works at Hyundai to make cars more recyclable. And you can find her research almost anywhere, including at conventions like South by Southwest, where we are today. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure, so I'm a senior polymer materials engineer at Hyundai, which means I'm responsible for all of the plastic components in North and South America. How'd you get into this job? Kind of by accident. <laughs> um, I went to Georgia Tech for undergrad and I came in as an undeclared engineering major. And we went through an engineering 101 seminar where each of the engineering disciplines came in and told us about what it was like to work in that field. And mm. the only one that really captured my attention was materials. And they came in with all these examples of things that you could do with materials and it spanned all these different industries and I was like that's what I want to do materials are everywhere materials are making a tangible impact on people's lives so that's what got me in was that interest in sustainability right from the beginning of my career um, and it happened to be in automotive so fast forward 12 or 13 years and here we are and what are you doing now now I do a lot of work on exterior and powertrain plastics, so supporting the battery electric vehicle platforms, a lot of focus on light weighting, on carbon footprint reduction, on sustainable material feedstocks that go into those components. The powertrain is the system that propels the car forward. Okay. So I'm in charge of all of the plastic components in those systems. So you like choose which plastics are going to be used and how do you choose? So Hyundai globally has a number of different goals that they're working towards specifically for sustainability. The first one being 20% recycled plastic by weight by 2030 on all of our vehicles. Okay. And then we also have an overall goal of carbon neutrality by 2045. So all of those material choices feed into that overall goal for carbon neutrality. Do you feel overwhelmed trying to reach those goals or how's it going and how are you getting there? Yeah, so right now there's certainly a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of different technologies for recycled and sustainable content. So it's a very open field. We're evaluating a number of different options from recycled materials, mechanically recycled, chemically recycled or advanced recycled materials, yeah. as well as bio-based content. So there's really an endless opportunity for how we want to achieve these goals at this point. What advice would you give to like a college student who's maybe thinking about engineering and but maybe wants to do what you're doing? What kind of advice would you give them? My biggest advice would be to be your own biggest advocate. So identify your own goals in the direction that you want to go and put the word out there and find your support network that can help you achieve those goals that you want to work towards. It's a lot of persistence, yeah. especially for a woman in engineering to say, not only you can do it, but when you get here, you're not going to be by yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those ideas you maybe thought would be rejected, but have been embraced? I would love to. So I was working on a test method for screening materials for thermal runaway for batteries. And so thermal runaway happens when the battery cells increase in temperature above a threshold of normal operation. Okay. And what happens is there is a large release of energy when that happens. So we say that it's a spontaneous exothermic reaction, meaning the temperature ramps up at a very high rate. Um, and so in the industry, there were not very many tools available to screen how materials would perform in this situation. And so what I did was I looked at that gap and I said, how can we have a stepping stone in between this very basic, quick and easy, cost-effective material screening method and this very intense kind of longer mm -hmm. uh, test for the full vehicle? And I developed a scaled down version of essentially that full vehicle oh. test. What I was expecting was a lot of questions of, did you consider that? Or we've always done it this other way. Mm. We don't want to change. We don't want to add a test. Um, and I, I did get some of that feedback, but overwhelmingly the support was very positive. And I saw that 
uh, the test method was actually rapidly adopted in the industry. It was oh, that's great. Thank you. It was published as a standard with UL, um, and it's it's available, and and many material suppliers are using it. My goal when I set out to do this work was to show that. Uh, plastic materials could be feasible for a battery enclosure application. So historically, these enclosures have been made out of metal, uh, steel, or aluminum. And in this case, I wanted to show that um, polymeric materials could also be an option. And they are? Yes. That's really great. And that's that's great to hear the industry has accepted this and you've really done some groundbreaking work. What other challenges are you really tackling right now? One of the other projects that I'm focusing on right now is the truck bed for the Hyundai Santa Cruz vehicle, which is uh, an open bed. We call it a sport adventure vehicle that launched in 2022. And so one of my projects was to do a collaborative project with our engineering design department to in improve the quality of the parts, uh, reduce the weight, reduce the cost, and of course, have some sustainability wins in there as well. What kind of, of evolution since you've been working on this have you seen in, in plastics, in automotive, and, and I guess sustainability in automotive? One of the big shifts that I've seen is moving towards composite materials. So plastic materials that have some reinforcement in them, whether it's glass fiber or carbon fiber, or even in some cases a natural fiber reinforcement. And the permutations that you can have in the composition of that material are essentially limitless. You can tailor it at any infinite number of ways to meet the performance that you want. As far as sustainability go goes, we're seeing a lot of effort in advanced recycling technologies. So mechanical recycling is very well known, very well established, and we're starting to see the addition of advanced recycling through a variety of different technologies. And all of these technologies uh, can be uh, complementary pieces to the sustainable solution that we want to create. And that's something that Hyundai is interested in and investing in? Yes. So we have a timeline for the goals that we've set out for recycled content. That includes short-term goals that are more on the mechanically recycling side, um, with more of the commodity resins, and then a midterm goal that encompasses some of those more advanced recycling technologies. What do people need to know? Advanced recycling is not something most people know about. It seems like a key aspect to these goals and to other goals that are sort of on my radar. Um, what needs to happen? I know it's something that needs to be kind of scaled and come, um, it's, it's in its infancy, I think. What needs to happen from your perspective? To, to get you all further and probably everyone else further as well. Yeah, I think early adoption is going to be key. It's one of those cases where the scale is driven by demand. So the more we see customers embracing sustainable content, the more we're able to pursue the development of those technologies. Mm -hmm. You guys have been learning a lot as you go through this process. What can be applied to other industries? There are two key lessons that I want to highlight. The first one being that we have an opportunity to be very proactive and to collaborate early in the design process. The second part that I would like to emphasize is that there can be a right material for each place. So thinking about the appropriate and responsible selection of materials upfront in the design so that we can have recyclability at the end of a product's lifetime. So choosing materials that make it easier to recycle that stuff when it's all over. Yes. Makes everything smoother. Yes. How do you find those? Because I mean, in my head, I'm like, well, wouldn't they already have found them? But I guess not. Yeah, so there are materials that are easier to recycle than others with the technologies that are available now. And there's two big trends that are happening in design. One of them is moving away from the vast number of different materials that we use in assemblies. So right now, there can be many different materials that are all put together in one complex assembly, and they're very difficult to separate out and to sort out. you have to take them all apart. Okay. Exactly. And it becomes a very manual process where you have potential contamination of those different feed streams. 
So being able to design with a fewer number of materials, we call it mono material design, choosing one material that you can make an assembly out of simplifies that process. The other trend is designing for disassembly, making it easier for the dismantlers at the end of the line to be able to quickly pull the parts off the vehicle so that there's not a big time and labor investment in recovering these raw materials. Probably makes this all a little bit more economically feasible as well. Yes. What innovations are making cars more recyclable? Designing for recyclability sounds like one. So I think we tend to have this mental image of junkyards with old vehicles stacked up and people go in and they pull parts out to repair yep. their own vehicles. And that's part of the end of life story. But what happens after that, once there's no content that can be feasibly reused off those vehicles is that they're actually shredded and they're put into a landfill. So all these vehicles that reach their end of life are ending up in the landfill as waste material that we are not able to recover. So there's a a big effort going on right now in being able to recover those materials once they've been shredded before they end up in the landfill and being able to recycle this now mixed up lot of all the materials that are in the vehicle and being able to produce something usable out of that recycled content. Are you satisfied with like the pace that, that those efforts are moving along? They could absolutely move faster. Yes. Uh, and it goes back again to the dismantling process and the ability to move high volumes of material through these facilities. So technology improvements like sortation, um, like traceability and documentation, so we know what we're getting in the door and we know how to better handle those materials are all going to help that process move more efficiently. One of the things that I'm very passionate about is biomimicry as a design thinking methodology. So looking to how nature solves engineering problems yeah. and then emulating that in the human design space. I'm actually very inspired by Leonardo da Vinci. Oh. Uh, he was an inventor and sort of maybe an early biomimic. And what I liked about him is is the cross-section of the artistic mind and the inventing mind and the ability to think about problems in a new and different, new and different way and to put those ideas out into the world. So for example, if you were looking to improve the impact resistance of something like your car door, you would look to nature and you would say, what examples in nature exhibit good impact resistance? Yeah. And you might come across things like beetle wings or like tree bark and you could study those and say, what is it about those examples that impart good impact resistance? Is it the material composition? Is it the structure of how it's assembled? And you can dis distill those design principles and use them to design your car door to have those same properties. We've used biomimicry as a brainstorming tool in our division. So for example, when I first came across the concept of biomimicry, I was working on a design competition at work and I was looking into structural color, which is where you use the effects of light on a surface and how the light interacts with that surface to create a visual effect, to create the effect of color without actually using a dye or a pigment. And so I was studying beetle wings and the way that they can have this very bright silver metallic effect just from the way that the material is layered without actually having any metallic or pigmented component to it. Oh, cool. And so this idea of structural color is something that is being developed for the automotive industry and for coatings and paints in general. Okay, I'm going to read you a quote that I read that you said, in my opinion, there's no such thing as an as a unrecyclable material. There are just materials that are traditionally not dealt with in standard recycling processing. Tell me more. So there are some materials that are easier to recycle than others. And there are some designs and constructions that we talked about earlier that are difficult to recycle with being able to separate them out and uh, separate out those feed streams. So it's not a question of materials that can't be recycled. It's just a question of complexity sometimes. And so the idea that if we put our efforts and our thinking towards a 
particular material that we want to solve, there's no reason why that raw material itself can't find a second use. Maybe all of us would like to see that. Um, Amanda, thank you so much for being here today. I know it's been a long day. I appreciate you. I appreciate the work you're doing. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Um, I, I feel better with our cars in your hands. And um, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us on today's Sustainably Speaking. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you again soon.